We're seeing God working in his life to bring about the nation of Israel, who will ultimately bring about Jesus, who will bring salvation to the world. Now, like I said, we're going to cover uh, a real brief highlight reel of Abraham's life. Then we're going to look at the covenant that God establishes with him and what that means for all of us. So Abraham is just one of those iconic figures in history, especially for Israel. I mean, literally, this guy's the start of the nation of Israel. So he's a real big deal. <clears throat> And it's because of this covenant that God begins with him that starts the nation of Israel. So who is Abraham? Well, to start with, the Bible gives an account of him starting in Genesis chapter 12. And it's really brief, but we'll go ahead and cover it. Uh, he was born in the land of Ur and lived in his father's household until he was 75. Okay, and then the Lord called him. So regardless of where you are in life, man, God started dealing with him at 75. So it doesn't matter. So be encouraged. Take hope. Take heart. Uh, but let's look at Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4 to see what God speaks to him. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your land, your relatives, and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse anyone who treats you with contempt. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran. All right. So this is all initiated by the, uh, by God. And he's telling Abram to leave the safety of his father's land. Okay, here we have a 75-year-old. He is living with his father. And uh, in fact, I didn't cover it in this, but just before this account, his father actually dies. And then God calls him uh, to follow him into this new land. And so we're talking about a traveling tribe, essentially, a nomadic tribe. You know, as the biblical account goes on, we see cities being established. In fact, cities are fairly new with Cain, correct? Only a few chapters back. Uh, but cities kind of represented islands of safety, okay? So there was a city wall built around the city, and that's what kept all the criminals out. That's what kept all the, the crazy people who do crazy things out. Inside the law, or inside the city, we see justice, and law and order. In fact, uh, scripture talks about a heart that is wandering into sin. It's like a city with no wall. It's not protected, okay? So cities, again, represent safety. Well, they didn't have a city. They had a traveling tribe, if you will. They had a tent, or, well, not a tent. They likely had multiple tents. They had some servants. They had some herds of livestock. But when it came time, they, were, they would pack up the tent. They had herd up all the animals and say, all right, well, we're going that way. And they would travel. <clears throat> this is what Abram is living in. This is his father's house, his father's tent, if you will. <clears throat> so God's calling him out of there. And there's inherent risk in what God is calling him to. He's literally leaving safety. He's leaving security, not just safety in numbers, but also in his father's provision. He's leaving, I mean, he's leaving his home. He's leaving all that he's known to go follow God. God has said, I will make you into a nation, a great nation. I will make your name great. And you're going to do all these things and I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm going to bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. So come on, come with me, leave your father's house. Again, this is leaving safety. And so as we look at this, we see Abram is faithful even in the face of this risk. I mean, there's great reward, right? I'm, I'm not going to sidestep that. If he does this, there's great reward. And that's probably a big driving incentive here. But there's also risk that it might not work out. So Abram obeys. He takes his wife, his nephew Lot, and all their possessions and the servants that they had. 
So again, while this is not a city, this is a large group of traveling people. Has anyone ever been backpacking or camping? You got all sorts of like light backpacks, the uh, alloys, uh, excuse me, like tent posts that are made out of titanium, so it's super ultra lightweight. You've got your cooking set that's aluminum, so it's very lightweight. Your little jet boil canister of gas. Got all these things like that. They had none of that, okay? These are like tent poles made of wood that don't collapse. They don't snap together. You know, a bunch of leather that they're stringing things up. They have these likely uh, animal skins or rugs that they've made that make up the tent and the tent floor. They, they, they don't have collapsible pots, so this is a big deal that this group of people are saying, okay, we're splitting off, again, from a large group, which there's safety in numbers, and we're going to go boldly follow God and what he has asked us to do. As Abram travels through Israel and the surrounding region, in fact, it's quite a lot of territory that Abram uh, travels through, but as he does it, God is showing him the territory saying, this is the land that your relatives is going to inherit. Inherit. This territory is where all of your offspring are going to be. And twice, everyone's like, this is incredible. This is awesome. This is fertile land. It's very good. And two times, in two different cities, he makes different altars and worships God, giving thanks to the Lord, worshiping him and giving thanks for what God is promising he's going to do. Now, eventually, a famine happens, and Abram goes to Egypt. Now, there's several foreshadowing here going on. But Abram goes, him and, you know, it's not just him, right? It's this big group of people. It's their tents, their livestock, his nephew, Lot, both their wives, their servants. They all go down. So they go to Egypt, and something very odd happens. Even though God has promised to bless those who bless him, to curse those who curse him, he's still overcome by fear. So they get to Egypt and it, and, and it literally says, he looks at his wife and she's so beautiful that he is afraid that when they get there, they're gonna kill him and take his wife. He's like, Sarah, you are too much. You are too gorgeous. And because of that, we have to lie. We have to lie to the Egyptians. We're gonna tell them that I'm your brother, you're my sister, so they don't kill me and take you as their wife, which is a really strange lie in my personal opinion, because then it's like, well, great, you're her brother. This is my wife now, but whatever. Getting ahead of myself here. So he's overcome by fear. He's not trusting what the Lord has said, and they lie to the Egyptians, saying exactly that. I'm her brother, and she's my sister, and we're here because there's a famine. And the Pharaoh goes, great, how wonderful. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take her as my wife. Here's a bunch of livestock. Here's some servants. Here's some, you know, precious metals. This is great. And what happens? Abram's like, kind of like, oh, great, what have I done? And in fact, Pharaoh takes her to his household and what does the Lord do? He strikes them with what scripture says, severe plagues. Again, what foreshadowing, okay? But God strikes them with severe plagues and in fact tells Pharaoh, we're not necessarily told how, but God tells Pharaoh, actually, that's not his sister, that's his wife. The very next day, early in the morning, Pharaoh's like, uh, what? Are you kidding me? Why would you lie? So he brings Sarah back to Abram. He's like, this is ridiculous. Why did you lie to me? Here's your wife back. Just go. Just go. And so they do. And so, again, God is faithful. He works it out. Even though Abraham lied. Okay? It's interesting here. Abraham lied, and yet God is still with them. So, Abram gets his wife back. He's got a bunch of new livestock, a bunch of new servants, a bunch of precious metals. And they're like, great. Let's move forward. So they move forward and they end up traveling near Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Now you probably do recognize that name. But Abram and his nephew Lot end up parting ways here because some of their servants are arguing over whose livestock gets more water, whose livestock gets to graze in the field. 
And Abram and Lot wisely say, you know what, look, this is getting to be ridiculous. We're, you know, hashtag same team. We're not meant to fight. So we're just going to part ways. We're going to go graze over here and y'all go graze over there. They agree on it and they part ways. Lot ends up living near Sodom and ends up being taken prisoner when war breaks out nearby. And Abram assembles his men to go and save him. In fact, we're told 318 trained men he sends out to go save them. And they save him and they bring him back. In all of this, God speaks a clear promise to Abram that he would make a nation out of his offspring. Yet this whole time, they've not had any offspring. They've not had any kids. In fact, his wife, Sarah, the scripture says that she was barren. She could not produce children. So you can see how this kind of leads to a little bit of tension here. They're like, okay, God, what are you getting at here? What's going on? You're, you're claiming that you're going to make a nation out of my lineage, my family, my offspring. And I have no offspring. I'm looking around here. I have got no children. So what's going on here, God? What Are you pulling my leg? What's going on? So Sarah comes up with an idea that she will give one of the female servants to Abram to father a child with. And clearly, that's what God meant. Clearly, this is the offspring that God had in mind. So they go and do this. And surprise, surprise, it causes a lot of issues. In fact, it should be no surprise. This causes lots of issues. Uh, lots of complicated family dynamics, if you could imagine, to put it diplomatically. And it causes bitterness. It causes suffering. It causes pain. And it's a big problem. Yet this is not what God had promised. Then we see God establish in chapter 15... Okay, so again, we've been summarizing a highlight reel here, so thus far. But Genesis 15, this is the chapter we're going to cover more verse by verse here. And this is where God establishes a covenant with Abraham. Even though all this stuff has gone on in the background. Him lying to people, him having a child outside of wedlock. All of this is going on, and yet God still chooses to have a covenant with him. Read with me, Genesis 15, verses 1 through 3. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I'm childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abram continued, look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. God clarifies to him that, no, in fact, this is not my promise. I'm telling you, it's going to be one of your offspring. So Genesis 15, 5 through 8, God takes him outside and he says, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them, which, have you ever tried doing that, counting the stars? Good luck. So he takes him outside and says, look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. And then he said to him, your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now this is very significant and we'll unpack that later, but like mark that in your brain or mark that in your Bible if you have it. God credited to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Again, speaking of what would become the territory in the nation of Israel. Now, this is a slightly mysterious image that we're given next. But there's an answer for it. Abram sacrifices two, or excuse me, animals to the Lord, and God uses this to officiate the covenant between God and Abram. So Genesis 15, 9 through 12, he said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. 
So he brought all these to him and cut them in half and laid the pieces opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in half. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly a great terror and darkness descended on him. Okay, Abraham does what God commands him to do. He sacrifices the animals. He's obedient to God. And God reinforces this promise to him. God then tells Abram the future of his offspring, the nation of Israel. He tells him that they're going to go to Egypt and be enslaved for 400 years. God will save them and then they'll come to the promised land and will uh, take it from those who live there now, but it won't happen yet. Interestingly, God says, because their iniquity has not been fulfilled. So God knows this is a wicked people that's there, yet their sin has not reached the limit where God is going to let it be, and then that's when Israel will take it from them. Genesis 15, 17 through 21. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadamites, Hithites, Perizzites, Rephraim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Say that five times in a row. <clears throat> but God makes this co covenant and he seals it with this sacrifice that Abram makes. Now, there's something very important going on here. Abram falls asleep for this. How strange. We're told uh, he, a deep sleep comes over him and he's just out. Okay, he cut the animals and then it just basically passes out. Maybe not quite like that, but you, you're following me here. So he goes to sleep and this is significant because it shows Abram, while yes, obedient, the majority of this is on God. God is the one who actually officiates this covenant. God's saying, look, all of this is on me. I'm taking responsibility for this and I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great, which, fun fact, I'm preaching on Abram some thousand odd years later. So that just goes to show that, yes, God was faithful and God, yes, made his name great. Now, I found this, comment, this section on a commentary here that I really like, kind of talking about the smoke and fire. Uh, it's from a commentary on Genesis. It should be a quote I have. It says, the smoke and fire seen on verses 11 and 12, like the fiery, cloudy pillar of Exodus, were evidently a theophany. Okay, great question. What is a theophany? It is a physical manifestation of God. Remember, God the Father is an uncreated being. He's totally different than us. We are created beings. He's totally different. So a theophany is a manifestation of God, which manifestation is a new agey word. Uh, that means things that we're not talking about here. This is literally God making himself physically represented in symbol. So if you continue on, a manifestation of God in symbol, he alone makes the covenant. The accent is on his initiative and giving as verse 18 makes clear. Now, this covenant is officiated. It is done. And now the nation of Israel is about to begin. Everything God says about the nation of Israel, what we covered just before this, how they would be enslaved for 400 years, how they'd be rescued, how they'd go take the promised land, all of this actually happens and is recorded in the biblical account, thus proving God alone can see the future. But it also signals at the same time, God showing grace to humanity. First of all, because he's continuing to show that the promised snake crusher, okay, that first makes an appearance in Genesis 3, is still coming. You could put in parentheses here, the snake crusher, that's Jesus. In Genesis 3, that's the first time he's prophesied 
that he will come when humanity first falls. And this is a continuation of that. We've seen God act graciously with Adam and Eve, making animal skins for them after they sin, thus showing that God had sacrificed an animal, bringing blood to not atone, but to cover up their sin. He made animal skins for them so that they could cover up because let's just be honest, fig leaves are not good clothing, okay? God knew that. And he's like, look, this is ridiculous, guys. I'm gonna give you these. These are gonna fit much better. It's gonna work a lot better. We've seen God be gracious with Cain, marking him so that no one would kill him because of his fear of being killed because he killed his brother, which there's a lot of irony going on there. But God was gracious with him. We see grace when he saves Noah and his family. He doesn't totally wipe humanity. He saves a family and decides to basically restart humanity with Noah's family. And now we're seeing grace with Abraham. Remember the story of him lying to Pharaoh, choosing to force God's hand by having a child with a female servant instead of his wife? Yet God promised that Sarah would give birth to the child and they didn't trust God on that. Now, this is, there's a long timeline going on here. It's not just like God said, I promise this is gonna happen and everyone's like, that's not gonna happen and they go and do this. We're talking about like multiple decades they're waiting for this promised child, this promised firstborn of Abram. Which interestingly, this points to the fact that we can trust the biblical account, not just with this account here of Abram, but in general, because it admits embarrassing details over very important figures, such as Abraham, that he fathers a child outside of wedlock, that it embar uh, admits embarrassing details about King David, who has an affair. The fact that the Bible admits these things proves that we can trust the biblical account. It'd be very similar to you if I told you, I passed every single class I've ever been in with an A plus every single time. You'd be like, let me see that. Let me see the paperwork on that. But if I told you, well, I failed a couple classes in college and I had to retake math a few times, all that kind of stuff, you'd be like, yeah, that's probably true. I don't need to see the documentation on that. That's embarrassing, the fact that you admit that. So it's very similar here with the biblical account, the fact that it admits these things, we can trust it as a historical document. But Abraham, even though these embarrassing details we just admitted about him, not admitted, but the Bible tells us about him, even though those things happened, God showed grace because Abram had faith in God. You could kind of substitute the word faith for trust. Abram had pl placed his trust in God, in the promises that God was giving to him. He goes, you know what? I recognize you are a divine being. You are far above me. Your promises are are way more likely to come true than mine because I'm a fallen human being. So he places his trust in God. And because of that, he moves forward in obedience. The New Testament here points to this obedience as a great moment. And it was a great moment. Specifically in the book of Hebrews, if you flip over to Hebrews, uh, look with me at chapter 11, verses 8 through 10. Uh, but I need to give a little bit of background here. So the author of Hebrews is trying to establish the fact that it's our faith that saves us before God. It's not what I can do that saves us. Because think about it. The God who created all of creation, who created everything precious here, who made us in his image, created all things. And for me to say, ha, God's lucky to have me on his team. Just wait till he sees what I can do for God. And God's like, Dude, I created time, space, and matter. What could you possibly do? So it's not what we can do. It's our faith that we place in God that saves us. And that's what the Hebrew, author of Hebrews is trying to emphasize here. <clears throat> Look with me, Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. Well, we're going to start with 8 and then we'll move on. But by faith, when, by faith Abraham, when called, obeyed, and sent out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out, even though he did not know where he was going. God literally says, go. And Abraham goes, well, 
I guess we'll start going that way. And so he went and he was obedient to it. Now we're going to skip to verse 11 here in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And we're going to do 11 through 12. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who has promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and is as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. So God is working with Abraham because he placed his faith in him. He was trusting God and was obedient to God because of his faith. And this was credited to him as righteousness. Again, this stresses God's grace despite human sin and humans, uh, the fallen nature of humans. God is working with humans to redeem humanity. To give you a visual on how this is all working out, uh, God accomplishing his goal of redeeming humanity, imagine with, with me for a second, if you will, an hourglass. Okay? An hourglass. We're starting out wide here, coming narrow, and coming back out wide again. God created humanity. That's starting up here, the top of the hourglass. Okay? There's a lot of humans, and God makes a covenant with them. All right, go do what I've asked you to do. Go be fruitful and multiply. Go and be my image bearers. Literally, my, uh, what's the word? Ambassador on earth, doing what I've asked you to do. Go tend to the animals and the plants. Well, then humanity fell, and they fell into sin. So then God, it narrows down a little bit. We narrow down to uh, Noah and his family. Okay, God judges the earth, wipes it clean, sin still abounds. So then God narrows it down even further, working to just one person, Abraham. And through this covenant, he starts the nation of Israel. It blooms back out. Who brings Jesus, who then brings salvation to all people, and it blooms back out again. Okay, just a image to show you how God is working with humanity. I have another quote here from a commentary on Genesis. It says, So far, Abram has been tested chiefly in the realm of security, a burning issue to a homeless man, though stre uh, through stresses of anxiety and ambition. The pressure now builds up around a new center, the promise of a son, a hope to be deferred through six more chapters in some 25 years. That's how long they waited. So this is the goal from God's, from the beginning. This is God's goal. To bring about the nation of Israel, to bring about the Messiah, to bring salvation to the world. So that as many can be saved, will be saved. Just like it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It says, This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. To describe this overarching idea, it's commonly referred to as salvation history. What that means is, what is God's overarching plan, overarching plan here that he's doing with humanity? What I was just talking about there, the different covenants, the hourglass, I mean, realistically, that's what that is, a salvation history. And it's actually kind of important to know about because if you're looking at the wrong part of Scripture and you're interpreting wrong, you're going to be doing the wrong thing. So when we're looking at Scripture, it's important to recognize there's two principles to boil it down very simply. The Bible describes things and it prescribes things. It tells us about things that happened and it tells us to do things. If you're reading scripture wrong, you're going to be doing the wrong things. God gives marching orders, so to speak, to specific people at specific times. So, for example, when we're reading about the covenant with Abram, and it's telling us to cut animals in half, lay them opposite of each other, and that a flaming pot and a torch are going to pass through them, is that what we're supposed to do? No. No, that's not. It's describing that event to us. 
but a good example of what we are supposed to be doing in light of salvation history, where we are in the timeline with God. What scripture says is the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near to them and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, his followers. Well, as Christians in the church, what does that make us? That makes us followers of Jesus. That makes us disciples. So these instructions that Jesus is giving us applies to us. That's what we are to go and do now. Now keep in mind, all of this has been building up to Jesus coming on earth and beginning salvation here on earth. All of this, what God did when he first sacrificed animals for uh, Adam and Eve, promising the snake crusher would come, the Noahic covenant promising God saying, I'm never again going to flood the earth. And then coming back to uh, Abram, where he establishes the nation of Israel and their whole history, their kings, all of the prophets coming along, the wars that they fight, all of this is building up to Jesus coming here on earth. And us now as believers are to follow the great commission, go and share the gospel so that all who can be saved will be saved. To literally go and share the gospel with everyone in our life as we go is what we're told. It's all been building up to this. Now, there's a few things I want you to pull out of this sermon here. First of all, is how Abram is faithful to what God calls him to. He doesn't see it, he doesn't understand it, but he still does it anyway. Abram is faithful to what God calls him to. Even in the face of seemingly impossible odds, Abraham is still obedient. Take, for example, the promise of great reward for Abram, that he will be made into the father of a nation. His name will be great. But there were still risks that he faced. Yet Abram's faith is what drove him towards God. Sarah was barren. She was unable to produce children, even though God had promised this would happen. Uh, on Wednesday night, we talked about this. Uh, it's the idea that our faith never has contradictions, but it has tension. So, for example, we will eventually go be in heaven. Jesus will eventually come back. These are what theologians call a proleptic promise. Okay, proleptic. It's a heck of a word, but it's awesome. So a great example of this would be Jeremy, the guy who led worship. If I were to buy him a gift from Amazon, I purchase it, I tell him to ship it to him, it's going to take two days to get there because Amazon's awesome like that. Okay, that gift, I've purchased it. It belongs to him. It's on the way to him, but it hasn't arrived yet. It's a proleptic gift. I've purchased it. It belongs to him. I have the receipt to show it. It just hadn't arrived yet. It's the same thing with our faith. And it was the same thing here with Sarah and Abram. It was a proleptic promise. It had been purchased. It had been sent. It just hadn't arrived quite yet. So Sarah and Abram, they trusted God, even though when it didn't make sense. There was doubt on both Sarah and Abraham. And even though they definitely messed up along the way, they still had their faith in God and God still came through as faithful. He was still faithful to them regardless. God reassured Abram and Sarah that the promise he had made would happen. And we didn't get to cover it today, but God does give them a firstborn and his name is Isaac. And God actually even tests Abram even once Isaac comes to make sure his faith is placed in God and not in Isaac. But that's a whole other sermon for another time. At every step, God is faithful to Abram. So how does this apply to us? Well, once again, this shows God has been working towards the salvation of the world for a very long time. God is faithful to us and we can trust him. 
So for you today, I ask this every week, but I think it's applicable every single week. You personally, have you, have you heard the gospel? Have you heard the good news? Have you taken hold of the grace that is available to you through Jesus and what he did on the cross? In fact, Wednesday on our community group last week, or last week, this last Wednesday, we covered what does grace mean? It's unmerited favor of God. It means God's favor that you don't deserve. That's freely available to you through what Jesus did on the cross. So have you taken hold of that? Do you realize that this gift of salvation, this unmerited favor is totally free to you because of what Jesus did? Have you claimed the free gift of salvation by placing your faith in Jesus? For those of you who are saved, who are in Christ Jesus, who does have their sins wiped away, I want you to look at the arc of salvation history and recognize where we are and what we're supposed to be doing. That we're supposed to be obedient to God and what he's called, that we're to go share the gospel, that we're to go tell people about Jesus. Like I, I covered last week with Noah, the world was wiped out because of their sin and rebellion against God. Today, we take it for granted that forgiveness of sin is so easily gotten. It's just a prayer away. Yet, it was not always so. With Noah, like I said, the world was wiped out. But today, Jesus has already done everything. All you have to do is place your faith and trust in Jesus. And for us as Christians, all we have to do is share the message of the gospel with people. God does not say you have to convince people to become Christians. Apologetics have their time and place, but we just have to share the message. That's all we have to do is tell them and God does the rest. So for those of us in Christ Jesus, are you praying for opportunities to share your faith? God is looking to work with you through your prayers, but also your actions. Are you doing what he asks? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you so much that salvation is a free gift. Lord, that Jesus has accomplished what we could not do. And because of that, we now have access to you. We now have access to salvation. God, I thank you that you have been faithful to us here at this church. You've allowed us to open this church. You've provided a building. You've provided the resources to buy the chairs, to buy things for kids ministry. Lord God, I pray that we be an instrument in your hands to declare your good news, the, the news of Jesus Christ, the news of the gospel here in this community. God, that you would send people to this church that would hear the gospel, they'd become saved, they'd be baptized. Lord, we, we dedicated babies a few weeks ago that we would raise them up and train them in the way they should go. God, I pray that you would be with us, that we would be faithful to you and what you've called us to, that we would be a salt and a lamp to this community here in Albuquerque. For all these things I pray in your name, amen. Well, church, awesome. Do not forget. I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence, and I could just stay, I could just stay right where